Like with the vast majority of psychological labels and diagnoses, narcissism, by one name or another, is frequently subject to misappropriation through suggestion. In the modern era, how common it is for someone to consume content from a pop psychologist or internet guru and come out the other side believing all kinds of horrible things about themselves. Just take the online popularity of the various so-called psychopathy tests, for example. How many people have allowed these apparent sources of psychological authority to slip them the suggestion that they are, indeed, a cold, empathy-lacking, self-obsessed individual? Of course, frequent viewers of this channel will know that relative unconsciousness of one's own instincts is the precondition for this. Where ego boundaries are not as strong as perhaps they could be, someone remains vulnerable to these cultural complexes in whatever form they happen to take. Thus, indeed, these days, so-called narcissism, with its implicit cultural association of bad person, is apparently everywhere, with catch-all criteria applied through suggestion, without an appreciation for context, someone's personal myth, or psychodynamics. This is dangerous. Not only does it frequently lead to unnecessary alarm and distress, but, on the flip side, within the vagueness of the details, the real significance of actual narcissism and narcissistic behaviour whether genetic or acquired under adaptive pressure, remains concealed. This facilitates its Darwinian and Freudian core, manifest as nasty, often subtle and incremental psychosocial manipulation, to continue unimpeded amidst a cloud of distraction. Thus, in today's video, we'd like to share with you a true theoretical and practical understanding of what narcissism actually is, its psychodynamic and instinctual etiology, or its reason for existing in the first place, how narcissists gain and maintain control over their victims through gaslighting, and its relationship to character, inflation, and the trickster function along with much, much more. Over this video's runtime, you will hear several narrations from the writings of Steve Richards to members of our Young to Live By community on exactly this, the biopsychosocial dynamics of gaslighting and narcissism. Steve and Pauline Richards are the founders of the Institute for Psychosystems Analysis and have been working clinically on the front lines for over 40 years. They were personally supported by Franz Jung, Carl Jung's only son, to bring his father's work, Carl Jung's work, into the reach of ordinary people. Jung to live by, this channel, is a part of that promise. Let us begin with a question. A student asks something, to which Steve's response gives a great introductory statement to the topic. Wouldn't a narcissistic individual feel enormous instinctive pressure, since the ego is just going about its own objectives, without understanding its proper place and role in the psyche? If yes, how does narcissism remain a stable trait usually for the entire lifespan, despite such pressures. Steve replies, The genome in a narcissist expresses the narcissist's character. What is within, so too is without. Instinctive pressure is certainly felt, often as very low frustration tolerance. 
their psychosocial relationships are shallow, manipulative, and self-serving. Paradoxically, it, narcissism, is an adaptive trait, in that those who have it are often driven by lust, and are prepared to use all kinds of manipulation and deceit to obtain resources. It was adaptive in the highly selective and competitive Paleolithic environment, and it still is today. True narcissists cannot be changed. So-called narcissistic traits may be defensive adaptations to being abused, for example. However, character, in the end, will out. Those who are fundamental, that is, genetic, narcissists, will never change. They will shamelessly lie, manipulate, exploit, and abuse, whilst their inflated self-reference distills into such things as delusions and infantile entitlements. Another student asks, Are anima projections almost narcissistic? When someone meets a life partner or a new loved one, and they feel that passion and attraction, if part of their anima is for mating and relating, parts of himself become projected onto the other, right? Steve then replies, What's projected in anima projection is not a part of your ego, except in the case of a narcissist, where there is no love, only an auto-libidinous investment in themselves. In truth, therefore, they don't even love themselves. Gratification of auto-eroticism is not love. It's their ego that they project, and for as long as the other is invested with this, then they meet the narcissist's requirement for self-confirmation. So, a narcissist can't project their Jungian anima or animus onto a loved one because they don't love anyone. It's a facsimile, which they manipulate for self-gratification. The bond of mutual identification in real love isn't narcissism. It's an exclusive union of two people in relationship to one another. Narcissists aren't capable of that. Someone who has been conditioned to meet the needs of another's narcissistic supply may well believe themselves to be the narcissist. Gaslighting does that to people. Steve continues. The political phrase, plausible deniability, epitomizes gaslighting. The psychodynamics run on suggestion. Think of the Freud-Jung-Adler equation in order to understand motive in gaslighting. Psychodynamically, instinct, Freud, seeks the power, Adler, to express it. When power is elevated by virtue signalling, political, moral or religious authority, it necessarily inflates Jung and falls victim to both Adler and Freud. This normal progression is seen in exaggerated form in the narcissist. Narcissists gaslight all the time. They're so exaggerated in their pathology, however, that unlike the more workaday gaslighter, they act as if it's inconceivable that they could be seen through, and when they are, they simply drop any relationship that has done so. Ego gratification is all they care about. Gaslighting is most effective when it manipulates instincts, as the implicit and compulsive nature of these lowers consciousness 
and makes a cognitive defense ineffective. The student then continues, I'm interested in how plausible deniability epitomizes gaslighting. Do you mean this in the legal and criminal sense? The suggestion in gaslighting I've seen in a smaller one-on-one -on -one scale is a manipulation of the other's care or joy instincts into making them feel guilty or bad for something that wasn't their fault to begin with, thus catering to the person who is doing the gaslighting. Is this suggestion related to plausible deniability? Steve then replies, For gaslighting to work, those who do it must be plausible enough to firstly conceal that they're doing it, and then, if necessary, plausibly deny, under the pressure of everyday scrutiny, that they ever did anything at all. Gaslighting is an active form of manipulation and deceit, but if uncovered, it appears to be someone else who's responsible. Political gaslighting is typically incremental. After a while, compliance in a population becomes habitual, albeit with a discomfort persisting in the background, that keeps people vulnerable to the next suggestion. For tyranny to take, it must appeal directly to instinct. Conditioning of a population at the cognitive level can be resisted rationally. If, however, fear or uncertainty over the basics of survival are implied to be threatened, then a group or entire population will self-regulate according to the political direction of the tyrannical government. The phenomenon of instinctive drift in conditioned animals shows that conditioning in itself must be maintained to keep a desired behaviour active. Otherwise, the animal in question will simply return to its natural behaviour. Humans are the same. To be economical about controlling an entire population, all a tyrannical authority has to do is to imply the suggestion of an incremental threat to fundamental instincts, but with the way out, which is always in the direction of compliance, clearly indicated. The population will then self-organise collectively like a herd and obey. The discomfort which reinforces the suggestion of compliance is held against the prospect of something far worse if non-compliance is chosen. This ensures that instinctive drift does not extinguish compliance. That is the most economical and effective way of exerting control. Narcissists do this naturally. Their innate understanding of the manipulation of power and instinct endows them with a predator-like cunning rather than an academic intelligence. Their intelligence, such as it is, is adaptive towards their goal. Academic intelligence is often defenceless against it. A still life gaslight is one without direct action. It's just like a still image, without any movement, but a claim is implied about the still image that goes into the suggestion of its referring to something that it is not. The late Ronald D. Lang referred to something similar in his waterfall effect. It's economical as a tactic, but relies upon a mannered compliance 
brought about by the suspension of disbelief in the target or victim of the suggestion. Narcissists enjoy the economy of indirect control in this way. Another student asks, are narcissists only motivated then by sex as gratification? Steve replies, sex is far more fundamental than money. There are many, many quote-unquote normal people who would unhesitatingly steal someone else's life partner, but would be horrified at the idea of stealing their money. Money is Adlerian. Sex, Freudian. Freudian pathology seeks Adler in order to support itself. Adlerian pathology conceals its underlying Freudian intent with the trappings of power, for example, disposable income. Jungian pathology inflates itself with virtue and falls victim both to sex and to money. The narcissist seeks gratification and, fundamentally, the gratification bottoms out in instinct, hence Freud. Even their abuse of power, Adler, has the quality of gratification to it which is in service of corrupted or otherwise perverted instinct. With narcissists who elevate themselves to high political, religious or moral office, the inflationary Jungian pathology conceals both of their Adlerian will to power and their true Freudian pathological motivation for purely personal gratification. Another student asks, so does the narcissist suffer from an overinflated ego? Steve replies, an inflated ego and a collapsed ego are interchangeable. The inflated ego is really an inflated self-concept. A collapsed ego is one that reduces itself around a dominant idea of self-reference from within its self-concept. In both cases, something has occupied the available volume of the self-concept. For the narcissist, this is the compelling need to confirm their status and the accompanying sense of entitlement to satisfy personal gratification. The student then replies, do narcissists project more of their unconscious than normal people? Or is it all about narcissistic supply? Steve replies, Narcissists are more unconscious than most people in the sense that they are transfixed by their own elevated sense of importance and the drive to maintain this at anyone else's expense. Projection does not come from the unconscious as such, as the Jungians think of it, but from anything that is unconscious at the moment of its projection. With narcissists, they are relatively unconscious of anything deeper than their compulsion to self-gratify. This does not mean that other drives do not exist, rather that they're not important enough for reflexive attention unless they're to be used to manipulate others to meet their needs. Instinctive pressure is the main threat to the narcissist's ego. Their vulnerability to frustration needs to be compensated for by control of others. 
This reward feedback mechanism is the essential component of their psychological and psychosocial homeostasis. If instinctive pressure exceeds their capacity to discharge relief into controlling others, then they first react against others, either directly or indirectly. But if this does not work, they can suffer an implosion of libido into intolerable agitation or depression. This can result in accidents, self-harm, hysteria, or even suicide. In the extreme of the latter case, they will incline towards hurting others on the way out, so that even after death, they exert control and issue harm. The trickster in narcissists is as exaggerated as any other psychodynamic. Its role in the genetic narcissist is to maintain the homeostatic status quo of the narcissist's innate setting. This means that the trickster function is normally targeted externally at other people in order to regulate them. It would, under usual conditions, only attempt to regulate the narcissist if they were to adopt some unusually positive attitude towards other people and their needs. Those who live with narcissists will be familiar with the negative payback they receive when a narcissist acts uncharacteristically for the objective benefit of someone else. The experience is often interpreted as being gaslit and experientially, it is so. Functionally, however, they have witnessed the narcissist's trickster returning the individual back to their baseline setting. Thank you so much for watching today's video. We really hope that you found it useful. Take care, and we'll speak again very soon.